Hey guys, Solid here. It's Q&A time. The questions have been piling up, so I'm gonna try and answer these questions as best I can. It's kind of a shoot from the hip type scenario. So I'm just giving my off the cuff, genuine answers to these questions. So let's roll that intro and dive into it. So the first comment is from Andrew Disco and he is saying, I like your pajamas solid. Well, thanks mate. It's nice that you pay attention so closely to my poor fashion decisions. But the bigger question you gotta ask yourself is am I wearing any pants? As expected, we've got quite a few CRF300L questions and comments. I did wanna just jump into my modification journey. As I mentioned in the previous video I did on the L that I wasn't quite satisfied with the handlebar setup that I had. I'd like to state that that is all sorted now. The handguards fit perfectly to my new uh, handlebars. I ended up ditching the contoured bars and just getting seven eighths and I've had no problems. I got rid of the risers as well and that seems to be much better for my height. So. Happy days for me, I've been enjoying the bike. So the next question is from Ian and he is saying, can anyone tell him if it's worth upgrading his 2020 CRF 250L to a 2021 CRF 300L for people that have gone through that process of owning the 250 and now owned a 300. So if that's you, chuck your comments down below for Ian and help him out. I will try and give you an answer as well, mate, as I have ridden the 250 on and off road and one of my good riding mate owns a 250 and I've ridden with him for years while he's had that bike. So I've seen it handle just about every kind of riding scenario. As always in this channel, I'm not gonna tell you what to do. I'm just gonna give you different perspectives and food for thought and that's what I'm about. So I'm gonna try and give you a couple of perspectives. If on the one hand, the 250 isn't quite cutting it for you, you've got plenty of money to throw around and a small purchase of a cheap motorcycle is no big deal to your finances, then by all means get the 300. It's a fantastic upgrade over the 250, power-wise, weight-wise, look-wise, and it's just got more modern touches. On top of that, if you're very safety conscious and you commute an awful lot, the ABS on this bike is a definite winner in my eyes. On the other hand, if money isn't as free-flowing, you don't have large amounts of money just to throw around, you've already sunk quite a lot into that 250, you're really attached to it and you've just got it to where you want, especially if you've got a pipe, you've got the ECU, you've got the suspension sorted, all the gear bolted on that you want, and that bike really is to your taste, then I would say don't rush. Enjoy that bike for a little while and maybe wait a while because you are going to have recalls. This being in the first year of production, I am gonna be a guinea pig. It's just a fact of owning a brand new bike. You're going to get recalls. The other thing to consider and what I'm experiencing right now is a difficulty in getting some aftermarket parts. You do have to wait for the aftermarket specialist to kind of come to the party, develop their products. So at the moment, there's no big fuel tank. There really isn't that much of a reason to rush out and upgrade other than just a bit of retail therapy and getting yourself a better bike. So if you're in a tight financial spot or you really like your 250 but you're just feeling the social pressure, just tell them to get stuffed and hang on to your 250 for a while. So those are the two scenarios that I think will be best. So the next question is from a name I cannot pronounce. I'll throw it up on the screen and see if you guys can make heads or tails of it because I sure can't. Anyway, the question is, what do you think of the welded subframe on the 300L behind me? Well, it's an interesting question and it's definitely one that you need to consider before making the purchase. It's generally one I try and pay attention to when I'm purchasing a bike. So what do I think about the welded subframe? Well, for people who don't know what he's getting to here, there's two types of subframes really. There's the welded type where the subframe is welded and is part of the main frame of the bike like the 300L. And then there's bikes like the WR250R, the KLR650, the DR650, most of your dual sports that have a bolted on subframe that can be removed from the main frame of the bike. Now, generally speaking, it's better to have the bolted on type because if it does fail, you can remove it, put on a new one and continue on on your adventure. It's a much better outcome. Whereas if you're on an adventure and your subframe breaks on this and you wanted to change out the subframe, you can't, it's welded on. It could even potentially be a vehicle write-off depending on the country and the insurance policy you have. Something to think about there. Am I personally worried? 
No, not really. But you've got to remember every person is different. It's all up to how much you carry, what you're comfortable with, what your personal circumstances are. So I'm not saying this is the way you should do it. But the way I'm thinking about it is one, I really don't ask much of my subframe. I'm a light guy. I don't pack much when I'm camping. If you're a guy that packs a lot of crap, then well, maybe you need to think about that. You might be asking this little bike subframe, but if you pack relatively lightly and you don't ask too much of your subframe, you've got a good insurance policy and you're not too worried about it getting written off if you do break the subframe, then it's not really a big deal. But if those things do concern you, perhaps look at another dual sport and find one with a bolt-on subframe. The next question is from Riley and he is asking any suspension upgrades on the horizon? It is indeed on the cards. It's one of the mods I'm looking forward to most. Basically, I wanna see the cream rise to the top and that's hard to tell without the forums getting going on reports on videos and that stuff. I don't really wanna be a guinea pig in the suspension department. The suspension on this bike is doable for the foreseeable future. So yes, I will be upgrading, but no, not immediately. The next question is from Gus and he is talking about the handlebars here. He said, what did you have to do with the new bars not having the dimples for controls as the OEM bars do? Yeah, so for anyone that doesn't know this, basically stock handlebars on a bike generally have holes in the handlebars where the switch gear locks into so it doesn't move. So when you twist the throttle, the throttle stays where it is. Same for the other side of the handlebars. But when you buy aftermarket handlebars for the off-road, they don't come pre-drilled. So you're getting a universal handlebar. And it depends a lot on the bike you have. On the CRF 300L, I've drilled the bars. So I basically lined it up, drilled the hole in the bars and just eyeballed it. And it's worked out pretty well. I did have to drill twice on the throttle side to get it exactly where I want. The other route you could go is grinding off the nubs. I did that on my Yamaha WR250R, but that's because the switch gear and the throttle on the WR250R, it locks a lot tighter to the bars. I've, I read with guys that have done that with the Honda, it's a little loose and they've had to put double-sided tape to get it to stick properly. And that's not something I feel too confident about. Those are basically your two options. So the next comment is from Noel and he's saying, I wish there was a bigger tank for the CRF 300L. Me too, mate. The only way that's gonna happen is to contact tank manufacturers. Email them, text them, call them up, let them know that this is what you wanna see. Because if they don't see market demand for a product, they're not gonna bother because they're making money at the end of the day and that's what they're in the business for. So let them know, shout it from the heavens. So anyone with a 300L, type until your fingers bleed and send that email off to both Safari, IMS, and maybe even a service to get us 300L riders a bigger tank. So the next comment is from Firetrace and it's one I've been seeing popping up pretty regularly when talking about the 300L. And he's saying, I've heard about an engine rattle at steady RPM somewhere between 30 and 40 miles per hour. Have you experienced that? So the short answer is yes, I have noticed it. Long answer is it's not a big deal. I think a lot of these things tend to get blown out of proportion on the internet. It's not a big deal. It is there, you do feel a little bit of extra vibe compared to most other spots in the RPM range on this bike. But this is a very smooth motorcycle and that's the reason it's noticeable. It goes from hyper smooth to slightly less smooth for a short amount of RPMs. I'm trying to think where I felt it. It was probably between three and a half and four and a half thousand RPM. The only reason I did notice it is because I read about it and I was trying to pay attention to answer your questions. So if you're worried it's gonna be this huge paint shaking, filling rattling experience, it's not that at all, mate. It really is just something of note that people who ride the bikes just want people to know because it's part of the experience. It's no worse than any other dual sport I've ridden. So regarding the news of Triumph, a few people chimed in with ultra excitement. Diesel King said, I crapped myself the moment I saw the video. And Mike said, I pissed myself when I heard the news. Well, guys, I'm glad you're very excited, but you might also need to contact a physician. So the first email, I'm gonna keep people anonymous because emails are a little more personal, but the basic gist of this email is that they were watching the 490 adventure video and that got them thinking of the potential for the 500 EXC F to be a great lightweight dual sport. They currently own a 690 Enduro R for long traveling, but they're thinking of the 500 EXC F they've really been inspired by round the world Paul. I think it's a great idea, but there's two caveats. You need to 
have the money to do so as KTMs are very expensive. But if you've got a 690 Enduro, it sounds like money really isn't too much of a problem. If you're happy to service the bike basic maintenance, that is oil and filters at 2,000-ish kilometers, then no big deal. The bike will really suit your needs if you can pack ultra lightweight. So they do make great off-road dual sports if you know what you're doing, which it sounds like you do. So yeah, I think it could be your unicorn, mate. If you're after high performance and you want to do adventure riding, it's hard to go past a 500 EXC if you got the money to back it up. So the next question is a email. So it's fairly long. So I'm just going to do the TLDR. That is the too long, don't read version. Everyone's different. You've all got your own variables, finances, your own needs, your own skill levels, and your own ability to research and educate yourself. So that's where I always start with. If you've got lots and lots of questions, start educating yourself. Head to Adventure Rider, head to Thumper Talk, watch lots of YouTube videos, try and get an idea of who you are and where you fit within the category. In saying that, let's get into this question. So basically, this guy is an older bloke. His son has been into off-roading for a little while. He's wanting to get his license. He's also committed to do a big adventure trip next year with his son. So fantastic, mate. Welcome aboard. So what you've basically said to me is you're a complete beginner. You're in the process of organizing your license. You know that you don't want an MX bike like your son. Your son rides a WR250F and I would completely agree. That's just a race bike, an enduro. It's going to be terrible for any kind of adventure trip. Not only because it's going to be so rough and high performance, so the suspension is going to be stiff, the motor is going to be super responsive, it's going to be a annoying and fatiguing experience for that amount of distance, but also the amount of oil and filter changes you'll have to do on that trip will just drive you mad. So I think the dual sport is probably the best bike for you. You've said it here, I do not aspire to jumping over trees, logs, big rocks flying through the air as in motocross and that kind of thing. So that really speaks to the dual sport category. They can basically get through anything if you have to, but they're also far more comfortable far easier to live with, just a nicer place to be long distance wise. And they're also far less intensive to work on and they're far cheaper to own because they require less upkeep and maintenance. So I think that's the best category for you and your man size. So you'll need a decent bike. So I think most of the 250 dual sports will probably be out of the question as they probably don't quite have enough pull to do the highest speeds out in the middle of Australia. I think the one exception to that will be the WR250R. For me, it was a fantastic bike. It had plenty of power. I could do all day at 110 plus. It had plenty enough to overtake trucks out on the Great Eastern Highway and way out in the boonies. So I think it was fine. It did get complicated once it got a strong headwind. I did have to gear it down to cope with the headwinds, gear and overtaking trucks. So if you're wanting to do over 130 at any consistent rate, perhaps cross the 250R off, but it's definitely something to look at. The one factor that is frustrating is it's discontinued, so Yamaha no longer sell them new. So secondhand, they do kind of cost quite a bit. Another great bike could be the CRF 300L, that's the bike I own. The main problem with that is getting one in time. There's a long wait list for these bikes as the supply chains are really disrupted at the moment, so it is very difficult to get your hands on one. The next shipment comes in next month and they're already all spoken for. So you might have to wait until Christmas time before you got one, which is probably not the best idea when you're wanting to get as much experience as possible being a learner rider. The other problem I would point out with a 300L or the 250L in this point is the suspension. It's just really not up to coping with a bigger bloke. If you're just starting out learning to ride, it might be too much of a difficult thing to not only worry about the bike, but worry about fixing the suspension when you don't really know what you want out of your suspensions. You could look at the DRZ400. Now, for guys watching in America, we only have the E version. So that's the Enduro version, so it's quite powerful so it might be a little too much for you being a learner rider. It's got a bigger frame, so it will accommodate your largest size. It also has plenty of power to haul you along. The problem is the gearing here. Uh, it's really not that great for long travel at highway speeds. You can gear it differently, but it never really is a 100%. It really is quite uncomfortable to ride those bikes over 110. Some people will say I'm crazy, but I think it's because I've been spoiled by 
six gear wide ratio bike. So the DRZ can be a great bike because it has so much accessories. It's very good off road and there's just so many of them on the second hand market. You can pick one up that's already well set up. The bike, however, that I think could be the best for you, given your size and what you're wanting to do, that is the big kind of open roads out in the bush. I think the DR650 by Suzuki could be a fantastic bike for you, but there's plenty of them secondhand. You probably still can get them new as they probably got plenty of old stock laying around in Japan that they'll want to offload as they discontinue it. And they've got a great setup. It's a 650, so it's got plenty of torque and power, but it's not the kind of power that's really intimidating. The way it makes its power is quite great. It's nice and torquey. Uh, it's just a really easy bike to get along with. It's lower than the DRZ, so it's easy to get your leg over, get your feet on the ground as well, which has also got so many accessories. You can turn it into a fantastic adventure bike. It does only have five speeds, but it's a very wide ratio five speed, so it sits on the highway just fine. It's also fairly competent off-road, so if you do get into difficult terrain, the DR650 can get through just about anything. And the final thing is it's very easy to work on. It's a very simple bike, which is fantastic when you're way out in the boonies and something goes wrong. You can basically fix those bikes with a hammer and some duct tape, <laughs> that damn simple. So that's another bike I would think about. Really fantastic that you've committed to ride with your son next year and do a big adventure trip. I think that's gonna be an amazing life-changing experience, mate. So all the best. Thanks for reaching out and asking me the question and I hope you and your son have a fantastic ride next year. Let me know how you go. So that's about it, guys. If you've made it this far and you got something out of this video, consider subscribing. It probably won't hurt. And until next time, don't forget to stay shiny side up and I'll catch you in the next video. See you later, guys.